Well, if you would turn back to that passage in this rather strange Old Testament book of Ecclesiastes, uh, chapter 5 of Ecclesiastes, and we'll be having a look at those first seven verses. Let me pray. Lord, help us now. Please open our minds to this very tricky little book, but open us, our minds. Help us to work at this, that we may be enlightened by you. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. The, um, the playwright Samuel, Samuel Beckett produced a play entitled Breath. I don't know whether anybody's ever been to see it. Uh, it's only 30 seconds long. <laughs> and uh, there's no actors and there's no dialogue. It's quite an easy play, really, to write. There's, there's rubbish just put on, on the stage as props, nothing more than that. And the script is just a human sigh. In fact, it starts with a human cry of a baby and ends with the gasp of an old person dying. It's called breath. Now, in this book of Ecclesiastes, really we see sort of stuff like that. Ecclesiastes, in a sense, is a journal or a diary or a blog of a man that's really trying to sort of uh, discover what the point of life is. And he's asking, what is the point between the cry of a baby and the gasp of the last breath? What's the point? What's the point of life? There's a German philosopher, and uh, he invented a word. It's a lovely German word, Gewovenheit. What a, what a wonderful word, isn't it? Gewovenheit. And it simply means thrown down. In other words, his whole philosophy was that actually you're an accident, I'm an accident, everybody's an accident. You didn't ask to be born, you didn't ask to be male or female, you didn't ask to be the height that you were, you didn't ask to have the color eyes that you have and the skin color that you have and where you were born and the time. You're just thrown down, given height. And the book of Ecclesiastes, again, sort of looks at that. You know, what's the, what's the point of all this? But what is life all about? Are we just thrown down? Is there any point? Are we just breath between birth and death? Ernest Becker, in his book, The Denial of Death, writes this. Man is literally split in two. He has the awareness of his own splendid uniqueness in that he sticks out of nature with a towering majesty. Yet he goes back to the ground a few feet, into the ground a few feet, in order blindly and dumbly to rot and disappear. That's it, isn't it? I mean, in one sense, I mean, look at us, this incredible design, so it appears. And we tower above all nature, really but we go back to rot and decay and to nothingness. And the book of Ecclesiastes, again, in his, in his journal writing, in his blog that he puts up for people to read, he's, he's confused. On the one hand, we seem to be majestic. On the other hand, we're just going to rot and disappear. What's the point of life? What's it all about? It's confusing. He's been showing this again and again in this book. Now, I've been working my way through this book, and it is magnificent. And so if you've never read this book, it is a very strange book. Because he's looking, not from a Christian angle, actually. He's looking from what he calls under the sun. It's an expression he uses 30-odd times in the book. Under the sun. In other words, what he means is, just from a human perspective... I'm looking at life as if there is no above the sun. In other words, no God. And although I may talk of God from time to time, I'm, I'm, not, I'm not speaking from, from revelation of something that's come from above the sun down to this earth. I'm, I'm standing on this earth, gazing up and wondering what God is like. I'm trying to guess. Is there any point to life if there is no God, as it were? 
And he keeps on answering again and again and again and again in his blogs, in his journals, in his discovery, that there is no point. It's all meaningless. Meaningless. Meaningless, he says. And in fact, he starts his book with those very words. Everything is a complete waste of time. There is no point to anything. And yet, throughout the book, there are just little hints that what we need, you see, is to go above the sun. What we need is, is God. We need to know God. And there are just little hints like that. So he's saying, actually, there could be meaning, but the only way you could find any meaning to your existence, to your breath, to the fact that you were just thrown here in this earth, to the fact that actually life is rather confusing, the only, the only way that you can find any, any meaning would be if you could go above the sun and find God. Now, I want to say that loads of people come to that conclusion. Loads of people. Loads and loads of people that aren't necessarily Christian. Loads of people come to this conclusion. And it's one of the reasons why there's so much religion around. So many religious people. They're trying to find some kind of meaning. And so what he does now in his blog in chapter 5, in his journal in chapter 5, in his diary, is to think about and study religion. He's writing about religion. And he's particularly, obviously, thinking about Jewish religion because the Jewish religion centered around the temple because that's where he was. That was his contemporary religion, if you like, because the writer of this book is King Solomon and King Solomon actually built the temple, this Jewish place of worship. And so if you like, in his thinking, he's looking at the very best religion in the world and seeing whether there's any meaning in it. But look at his conclusion. His conclusion is verse 7. It's quite devastating. Much dreaming, many words, are meaningless. Therefore stand in awe of God. This is actually the first place and one of the only places in this entire book where he tells you to do things and not to do, which is quite interesting. Let's, let's try and unpack these seven verses, shall we? It's going to be a bit of hard work. It's one of the things I love about this book is it really touches the thinking of, of the age. Sometimes in churches we're not prepared to think, so we're going to have to do a bit of thinking tonight, okay? You ready for that? Anybody want to think? Okay, good. There's two at the back there. I've got you in my eyes, so just you, you and me. Let's try and unpack this. Here's the first point I think he's making. Point number one in his blog, in his journal, in this, in this particular part of his journal is religion is a trap. Religion is a trap. It's all the way through verses one to seven. I think he's trying to show us that religion traps people. Rather than take us above the sun... Rather than take us out of this world to, in fact, God, the very thing we really, really need to make any meaning in life, it actually firmly traps us down in this world, under the sun, miles away from God. Karl Marx, in one sense, is right. In fact, probably is completely right. Religion, he said, is the opiate of the people. It's a drug. It's a drug to keep you happy. Down and, and limit you down and keep you into this world. That was his whole complaint. It's a drug to make you believe something that just is not true about you. I think that's what he's saying. In other words, it traps you. Look, let, let me try to explain this. People around the world are natural worshippers in this sense. Wherever you go, Wherever you go in the world, even in a communist land where they try to ban sort of all religion and all the idea of the supernatural, even though kids that are brought up in that world to, are taught that there is no God and there is no supernatural and this world is all there is, still those children break out into some kind of religion. Mankind inherently, something in us, 
knows that there's something more than this world, that there is something bigger than this world, and, and longs for what the clever people would call a sort of transcendent experience. In other words, where we're taken out from under the sun and, and there's something of above the sun that we, we come to sort of feel. So most people know that we don't want to be limited to just this world, just to the physical. It's not big enough. This physical world and just the fact that I'm flesh and bone and made up of various chemicals doesn't explain what the point of life is. It doesn't explain the confusions about beauty and ugliness, the confusions about the majestic human being and then the fact we go to dust. It doesn't explain what life is about. Just the physical science, if you like, of this world doesn't explain those things. It's not enough. It's not big enough. And so we long for something more. And this is the problem. This is the problem. Religion, religion traps us into a false sense of security. Religion makes us feel an above-the-sun experience. The vast majority, he's saying here, I think, in this chapter, the vast majority of what goes for worship of God is not worship of God at all. It is meaningless, in fact, meaningless disbelief in God. People often turn to God or religion, and here's a big word, but I want to explain it, simply as an existential experience. In other words, a sort of thing that you feel. Let me explain. If life is just breath, if that's that's all life is, if life is just gewovenheit, you can tell I like that word, in other words, you're just meaninglessly thrown down, then everything, everything is meaningless. But how can you live like that? How can you live in a world that's meaningless? What's the point of getting up in the morning? What's the point? What's the point of doing anything? What's the point of doing good stuff? He works this through in this book, and I have time to show you. But uh, why, why be good? What, what, why be good over being bad? Why put myself out for anyone? What is the point of any of this is if we just cry and die and that's it. There is no point if there is no judgment, no afterlife, no God. There's no point. There's no point in studying. What do you, what do, you do? You with the stripes in the middle there. You what? I didn't hear what you said. Well, what a waste of time that is. <laughs> Completely and utterly meaningless. What do you do? Yeah, completely meaningless. I mean, what's the point of splashing a bit of colour on a, on a thing? It's totally and utterly meaningless. Right? Now, exactly. Art is this, this is it. Modern art is very much like this. Lots of stuff in the Tate Modern is, is exactly like this. We can't live. We can't live like that. If everything is meaningless, we can't live like that. So what do we need to do? We need to make our own meaning. We need to make up our own meaning. We've got to have some meaning somehow. That's what existentialism is, if you want to know the philosophy. And one way of making meaning in our life is religion. One way of making meaning. Therefore, and I think he's saying this in this book, it's not God you're worshipping. Do you see that? It's yourself. It doesn't take you above the sun at all. It keeps you down here, wrapped up with yourself. It is not an encounter with God above the sun, religion. It's not an encounter with with a God that you want to love and know and serve and enjoy and listen to and experience. It's not a God that would change you in any way. It's just a religious existential experience that keeps you down in this world but actually at least gives you some meaning even though there is no meaning it's all a pretense it's like a drug i suspect in a crowd this big there's a number of people that have taken lsd 
You don't have to admit it, but I bet you there's some that have taken LSD, the hallucinogenic drug. And if you've ever taken that, you know what happens. You pop the pill, and it feels like you're having a spiritual experience. The sofa turns into a mushroom. You look at your wife, and she's a lump of cheese. And she turns pink and yellow with spots all over her. And it feels like you're taken out of the world. It feels like you transcend this world. But of course, it does your brain in and it pulls you right down to earth. It was all a pretense. It's not real. That's why religion is so full of things that don't attack the mind, but attack the senses and, and leave the mind completely out. Religion is full of that. So you have things like dark buildings with gold in them that make, that make you sort of feel some kind of sense. Or you have lots and lots of music and lots and lots of singing and lots and lots of chanting so that in the end you don't really know what you're singing but you're sort of taken out of yourself, as it were. Religion's full of that. Or there's, there's lots of prayer where you continually are parroting words and saying things again and again. And you may not even know what you're saying. You may be using words that no one really understands. You may be speaking even in a language like the Muslims do, that you don't even know Arabic. But you're repeating these words again and again and again as you bow down, as you, as you if you're Jewish or Muslim, as you sort of rock backwards and forwards to get the timing right so you can remember the words that you don't even know what they mean but it, it takes you above yourself as it were and there's postures where you where you throw yourself on the floor and open your or or you get very moved by a large crowd because when we're in a crowd of people and everybody's saying one thing we're taken along with it religion takes us so it feels out of ourselves but it doesn't it doesn't take you out of this world. It doesn't take you above the sun. It doesn't take you to God. It's a trap. It's a drug. It's the opiate of the people. And it immunes you to the real knowledge of God. Because you think you know God and you don't. So, first point. Religion's a trap. Second point. Religion is therefore dangerous. Again, look at these verses. It's all over these verses. We'll, we'll look at them again in just a moment. Religion is dangerous. Religion is dangerous because religion makes us treat God as an idiot. That's why it's dangerous. And therefore, you don't get to know him. See, what's the big problem in these verses? Just have a look down at verses, you know, 1 to 7. What's, what's the big problem? What's the big error in these worshippers? Let me read it out again in case you didn't get it. Look at it. Just have a look. Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. Go near to listen rather than to offer, offer the sacrifice of fools who do not know what they do wrong. Do not be quick with your mouth. Do not be hasty in your heart to utter anything before God. God is in heaven and you are on earth, so let your words be few. As a dream comes when there are many cares, so the speech of a fool when there are many words. When you make a vow to God, do not delay in fulfilling it. He has no pleasure in fools. Fulfill your vow. It is better not to vow than to make a vow and not fulfill it. Do not let your mouth lead you into sin. Do not protest to the temple messenger, my vow was a mistake. Why should God be angry at what, what you say and destroy the work of your, of your hands? Much dreaming and many words are meaningless. See, what's missing? What's missing in all of their worship and all of the things that they're doing and the vows they're taking and the sacrifices they're bringing? What's missing? What's really missing? Haven't you noticed it? God. God is the missing ingredient, isn't he? 
No one's asking God, because no one's listening, we'll come on to that in a minute. No one's asking God what he really wants. No one's talking to God. No one's listening to God. Everybody's just doing stuff. And it's empty. And God is missing. See, look what's going on here. You know, at least impl it's implied, isn't it? Uh, they're not guarding their steps when they go to God. There's just a sort of casual walking in. They're not listening to God. You can see that. They're offering sacrifices of fools. They're quick to talk and they're quick to make, make commitments, but have no intention of fulfilling them. It's all like a dream. They're expecting God to be pleased with this stuff as well. Their worship has got nothing to do with God. It isn't worship of God, it's worship of themselves. There's a total denial of any relationship with God. A total forgetting that God is in heaven and we are on earth, verse 2. There's no listening, there's no relationship. And I want to tell you that no relationship could survive such sort of blatant abuse as this. It's all outward, it's all doing things, and there's no reality. There's no above the sun. It's just rooted down here. Look at verses 2 and 3. Just have a look at it again. Do not be quick with your mouth. Do not be hasty in your heart to utter anything before God. God is in heaven and you are on earth, so let your words be few. As a dream comes when there are many cares, so the speech of fools when there are many words. I mean, Jesus talks about this. He talks about the religious people. He says, when you come to pray, don't babble on like the pagans. On and on, word after word, to think that actually that will get God's attention. D stop doing that, he says. One commentator says, the dreams appear to be daydreams, reducing worship to a verbal doodling. That's what religion is. It's a verbal doodling going on here. It's, there's no substance. There's no reality. Let me try to illustrate this, because these concepts are very, sometimes they, they're, they're difficult for us to get, but let me try to illustrate it. Let me illustrate it from the Muslim world. Listen to this. This is Hadith. This is Sharia law. Whoever washes himself up for prayer and then goes to the Muslim meeting place to perform prayer, every step he takes to the meeting place, a sin is washed away. See, what's missing? God. It's just automatic. It's just like putting money in a slot machine and out comes the chocolate bar. It's I wash my hands and I go to the house of prayer and every time I step, the sin's forgiven. It's wonderful, isn't it? You know, I, I could take a long route round as well and get so many sins as forgiven as possible. In the university in Kingston, where there's a, lot, uh, you know, a large Muslim group, a poster went up telling us that, again, it's from the Hadith, it's the words of the Prophet Muhammad, that if we go to prayers on Friday and we do the prayers, which are just, you know, they're, they're set prayers that you say and you bow down and you say and you bow down, you don't even have to know uh, what it means, you just have to know the Arabic expressions. If you go along to the prayers and say the prayers, hey, listen, your sins will be forgiven for seven days plus three. That's exactly what it says. I'm, not, I'm, I'm genuinely not mocking. I'm telling you the truth. That's fantastic, isn't it? See, what's missing? Relationship with God. That's what's missing. It's all just automatic. I just have to, I just have to wash my hands go along on Friday, do the prayers, not even knowing quite what I'm saying. I've got 10 days of forgiveness. Fantastic. That's worth it, isn't it? That's a great religion, isn't it? But hold, hold it. What about the Christian? It's easy to knock the Muslim. I was sitting in a cafe in Wimbledon. Some rather posh ladies were on a table with their little babies running around, drinking coffee. And I was listening into their conversation because that's the sort of thing I do. <laughs> and there they were talking about what? 
talking about getting their kids baptized, talking about getting their kids to take, you know, t them taking actually vows and things like that at the Church of England, local Church of England church. Why? What was the big reason behind it? Was it God? No, it's so their children could get into the Church of England school because it's the best one in town. Where's God in that? It's religion, it's vows. Some years ago, someone gave me this in London. It's a, uh, a leaflet inviting me to power of anointing ministry worldwide. Total deliverance and prosperity extravaganza. Wow! <laughs> Dr. O. Gilbert. There's a picture of him. Dr. O. Gilbert. But why would I go? Is it got much to do with God? Well, there's hardly, well, God is mentioned a few times, but not much. Not the, it's not the main emphasis. Why should I go? Well, I should go because Dr. Gilbert handles such cases as, and then he lists the reasons why I should go, acute bareness. <laughs> that struck me. I can't imagine how you could be unacutely bare. But anyway... I can be uh, healed of acute bareness, <laughs> hindrances in getting married, obstacles to financial prosperity, failure in business, recovering of debt, stopping sexual intercourse in your dreams. Here, here's the one that frightened me most and probably stopped me going. Casting out moving objects in your body. <laughs> That's my heart. <laughs> What's he going to do? The whole reason for going, really seriously though, the whole reason for going is me. It's, it's not to get a bigger picture of God. It's not to fall in love with God. It's just to go to the doctor to get healing. See, religion, religion doesn't take you above the sun to God. It's not a ladder to God. It shuts God away. It's worse than meaningless, I think the writer is saying. It's dangerous. It's dangerous because you think by doing this religious stuff and having some kind of experience of religion, you think you're experiencing God. Therefore, it's dangerous because you're not. It shuts you from above the sun. It keep, do you think God is going to be fooled with any of that stuff? I mean, you'd be better to go up to a policeman and slap him around the face than actually bring meaningless stuff like that to the living God, wouldn't you? You'd be better to go to a judge in a court case and spit at him than bring under the sun things like that to God. No, religion's a trap, I think he's saying. Religion is dangerous, I think he's saying, because it makes God to be an idiot. And the third thing is, and here's this, here we go. We've got to keep our minds going here. Religion reveal, reveals our real, real problem. See, what's our real problem? Well, it's in verse 1, I think. Look at verse 1. What's our real problem? It's not listening. I don't think religion listens. Look, guard your steps when you go to the house of God. Go near to listen rather than offer the sacrifice of fools who do not know what they do wrong. We must listen, ears before lips. That's what he's saying. Now, why don't we listen? And this is the root of the problem. Listening, but it, it goes deeper than that. Religion reveals our problem because it shows us we're not going to listen to God because we're going to do it this way. And why don't we listen? We don't listen because we don't trust. We don't listen because we don't trust. We don't trust God. We think he's not trustworthy. We think actually God is against us. We think that God is nasty. We think that God is not a good God. He doesn't want our best. And therefore, you're not going to trust anyone like that. 
We think that God actually despises us. We think that actually we'd be better doing religion to get that experience, to have above the sun experience, um, rather than listening to God who is above the sun. Because we don't trust. I don't know, has anybody ever, have you seen that film, uh, Born Ultimatum? Who's seen Born Ultimatum? Hands up. Oh, those of you, it's such a good film, if you're into sort of that sort of film. It's, it's such a great, I love all the Bourne, the Bourne films. But um, uh, it's such a great action film. You've you got to get it out. Get it out tonight and have a look at it. And, and have a look. Because Bourne Ultimatum, it, there's a fantastic scene in Waterloo Station. I, I'm not giving much, well, I am giving a bit away, but there you go. Should have watched it by now. Um, <laughs> Jason Bourne is the hero. He's like a real superman. You know, he's much better than that, but he's, he's just fantastic. He knows everything. He knows every language. He knows how... And there's some assassins after him to kill him, but also to kill this reporter that's associated with Jason Bourne. And they're at Waterloo Station, hiding out in Waterloo Station. And it's just an amazing scene, because you've got all of these gunmen all around waiting to kill Jason Bourne and this reporter. But Jason Bourne, he, know, he knows, because he's been totally trained up, he knows where the gunman will be, he knows where all the exits in Waterloo Station is, he knows human behaviour, how people walk and when the... You know, he know, he's so brilliant, oh, I'd love to be him. <laughs> but he's the hero, he knows, he knows this. And then you've got this wonderful scene with this reporter who's, who's, is he going to trust Jason Bourne? Because he's got to get out of Waterloo Station, otherwise he's a dead man. There are all these gunmen, professional gunmen after him. But Jason Bourne can get you out because he just knows everything. He knows, he knows there's a gunman up there. He knows there's one up there. He knows there's bound to be one up there. And if there isn't one there yet, there will be one in 2.3 minutes. He knows that. And so the reporter is coming out of the door and Jason Bourne is saying, stay there, stay there, stay there. They're link, linked up with, with phones. Stay there, he says to the reporter. Now, don't move. Now, duck! Now! Right at the right moment! You know, there's the gunman looking around. Duck now! And then stand up and then you're all right. It's fantastic. It's so, it's, honestly, it's a, it's, the, it's a brilliant scene. But the whole point of the scene is, and your heart's beating, you're saying, trust, listen, trust, Listen, listen to Jason Bourne, trust him. And the reporter's thinking, shall I, shall I, shall I go on my own? Shall I trust myself? I'll trust myself. Bang, he's dead. You fool. You're, you're almost shouting when you're in the cinema. You stupid bloke. Why didn't you trust Jason? I would have. The reason we don't listen and the reason he didn't listen is he didn't trust. Now, hold it. Let's get this. A little bit more work here. Eric Erickson was a very famous child psychologist. He is the bloke who outlines eight levels of social development from birth to the grave in people. And very interesting it is too. But the most fundamental level, he says, which is from age sort of naught to three... The most fundamental me uh, uh, um, stage is that, is that naught to three age, and it's all to do with trust. This is his big point. If, for instance, you have parents that you cannot trust or abuse you in some way, you are going to learn that the God figure in your life is untrustworthy. And if you can't trust, he says, that every other level in your life, if you're a non-truster, you will have massive problems. Now, in my experience of children who have been through difficult stages in their early life, that's absolutely right. Trust. And here's his big thing. I hope you're with me. I hope you're because it's so important. Here's his big thing. If you can't trust, you will be self-absorbed. If you can't trust someone else, you will be self-taken up. Because you're afraid. And there's nothing more self-absorbing than fear. You will try to protect yourself and defend yourself, but who can you trust? Nobody, so you trust yourself. 
So you're anxious. So you won't commit to anyone. Because you can't trust. Now listen. He's very, very pessimistic. But listen. The Bible says that everybody fundamentally has a problem with God. We don't trust him. We don't think he's good. We don't think he's got the best for us in mind. We're not convinced that in order to get out of this world where life is just a breath, we're not convinced that he's the one. Yes, we want an experience to live as if there is meaning when there isn't meaning because we can't live without meaning and so we invent religion. But we don't turn to God. And so people do all kinds of religious stuff, but they won't listen. And nothing, nothing tends to mask God more than religion. So here's my last point. How are you doing? How are you doing? What would the writer of this book, King Solomon, say to you if he looked at you? Is your worship Really, religion, just an experience to give you some kind of identity or meaning here in this world, but it's never taking you above the sun. Is your religion just dangerous because you think you're pleasing God, but you never really know him? It just is an opiate. It keeps you down here. So how's your walking? Look at verse 1. Guard your steps when you go to the house of God. Go near to listen. How are you doing in your listening to God? Or how's your talking? Look at verse 2. Do not be quick with your mouth. Do not be hasty in your heart to utter anything before God. How are you doing in your walking? How are you doing in your talking? What about your taking? Look at your taking, verse 4. When you make a vow or take a vow to God, do not delay in fulfilling it. He has no pleasure in fools. Fulfill your vow. It is better not to vow than to make a vow and not fulfill it. How are you doing in your walking with God, in your talking, and in your taking? The truth is, you're a failure. We've all failed. And that is why we need more than religion and we need more than ourselves. And that is why we need a trustworthy person in our lives. And that is why Jesus came. Jesus comes from above the sun. God became flesh. And lived for a while among us. The only way to have an above the, a real above the sun experience. And not a pretend one that just makes us feel good. The only way is that God would break down into below the sun. And that's Jesus. And that's why Jesus and religion are totally separate. God has come down. He is the word of God. Listen to him. Jesus is the one that you should listen to. And what does he speak? He speaks the message of God. And what does he say? He says that you can know God. For I have come to die to take your wrong. I have come to die in your place to make you right. I am the trustworthy one. I am the one who holds all heaven and earth in my hands. I am the creator who was created in order to rescue you. I am trustworthy. Trust me. Trust me. Trust me that when I'm dying on the cross, I am dying to take you above the sun so that you can know God, not as some vague sort of thing out there, but not some religious sort of character, but know God as a father, that you can enter into the family of God, that you can be born again above the sun in the kingdom of God, so that you can know that King God is Daddy God, is Father God, is your lover, is the trustworthy one. That's what's happened. 
And in all Ecclesiastes, in all his searching, and boy, we've got some searching here. There's some, there's some incredible things he does. All the time, he says, that below the sun you'll never find any point to life. You need someone to break down above the sun into this world as our rescuer. And that's what Jesus is. Religion, it's totally meaningless. It's a pretense. It's a sham. It's an existential experience which is just pretending that something's real and it isn't. Jesus, however, is truth. And the truth of God is he's totally trustworthy and is a lover who's come to rescue. Let's pray. Dear God, you know every single one of us in this room. You know everything there is to know about every one of us. You know whether we're just religious -y because it's quite nice. It gives us an identity. It gives us a sense of purpose. Or whether we know you. We thank you for Jesus coming into this world and seeking us out. We thank you that he died on that cross that we may be forgiven so that we can be friends with God. That all our sin would be wiped away. The barrier between us and God would be broken down. And we pray that you'd help us to know that. I pray for anyone in this room that is just religious. Lord, show them Jesus, we pray. We pray that even tonight they may come to know you. And we pray in his name, in the name of Jesus. Amen.